Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. Uh, first, I wanted to let folks know that we have a couple of new reports on our website regarding hospitals. Uh, the first one is the FY 2019 year-to-date actuals report. This is the first quarter uh, results of the hospital systems, which um, because they're for their fiscal year, it starts in October, so that's October, November, and December of 2018, and that is. Uh, it is on our website or it will be within minutes. <laughs> I'm looking at our folks out there who are putting that up. Um, the second report that is under um, listed under reports on our website is the report on financial health of Vermont's critical access hospitals. This is a report that we submitted to the governor last month regarding the financial health of Vermont's hospitals. So I just wanted to bring your attention to that. Um, scheduling, no meeting next Wednesday, um, so February 19th, February 13th, getting ahead of myself, no board meeting. Um, to report out to the board and to the public yesterday, we had a very productive data governance council meeting. We um, had a, a two goals of the meeting. We reviewed updated policies and procedures for that group, and then we also had a presentation from Lynn Combs, uh, one of our uh, lawyers on the updates to the data rule um, that we're working on. So it was a, it was a very productive meeting and um, made some great progress there. Um, the last thing, certainly not the least, but many of you probably have heard that our general counsel, Judy Henkin, has been appointed to be the deputy commissioner of corrections. And so she will be leaving us next week. This is actually her last meeting. So I just wanted to formally thank Judy for being on my left side here for the last five years and helping me personally so much as I, as I do my work and the entire Green Mountain Care Board. And we will miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Tom will be leaving the board because wherever I go, um, <laughs> somehow shows up at some point, so I'll just announce that now. Uh, I told him that I was very disappointed that the current commissioner's only been there since December, so I've got to wait a few years to <laughs> From rep to boss to commissioner to board member, it's just... As long as you don't follow her in stripes, we're okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what side of the bars he'll be uh, on, but we'll see. <laughs> so with that, uh, the next item is the minutes of Wednesday, January 30th. Is there a motion? So, so Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 30th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? If not... Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nobody's on the phone, correct? No. Okay. Okay. Then we're going to jump right into our regular uh, business for the day. And the first discussion is pharmacy pricing and uh, PBMs. And we're lucky to have with us today Brian Murphy from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Brian, if you could come down front. And whenever you feel comfortable, take it away. Um, can I announce one other thing regarding Certainly. handouts? Um, there are handouts to these presentations on the table up front. And um, if you're new, uh, there is a sign-in sheet, too. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can everybody hear me OK? Yep. Judy, congratulations on the new position. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, my name is Brian Murphy. I'm the Director of Pharmacy and Vendor Management at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. I've been with Blue Cross for about 12 years. Prior to that, I worked for eight years with um, a pharmacy benefit manager by the name of Metco. Um, and so I've basically been spending 20 years in this realm of either working for a PBM or buying services from a PBM and managing our Blue Cross Blue Shield partnership with the PBM. So I have a pretty good understanding and experience with what PBMs do, how they make their money and everything. And as I understand it, there's questions about 
PBMs, because it's not really a, a clear part of the healthcare delivery model, right? And there are huge companies, but a lot of people don't have interactions with them, so there's kind of a mystery that surrounds them. And I just thought I'd be able to hear, to answer everybody's questions and explain why they're kind of, what you make a point, I'm not advocating for any sort of current model, I'm just here more to try and explain and help people understand, you know, their role in it. Additionally, I also have slides on pharmacy pricing because a lot of that goes hand in hand with each other as to how drugs from a PBM uh, get priced and uh, gets delivered through the uh, cycle. Does that, all, that make sense? Yes. Uh, here we go. So, and that's basically the agenda. Um, you know, what are pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs, uh, as they're quickly referred to? Um, how are prescription drugs priced? And then getting into, I'm sorry. Um, and then, especially drug uh, increases and generic drug increases. They seem to have been in the media a lot lately, so I just thought I'd uh, highlight some of the issues around those too. Okay, what are pharmacy benefit managers? Um, since they're not really well known, I thought this slide was simplified. Um, <laughs> the, it's a rather complex system uh, that winds up delivering. And I always want to back up to explain why pharmacy is important. You know, a lot of times pharmacy benefit gets forgotten in the overall healthcare model. It's only 18% of the overall cost. Uh, it is really important though, for a reason being that when somebody goes to the doctor, about 85% of the time that doctor identifies something, you know, person has a condition, a disease of some sort, the first line of treatment is medication, right? And while not everybody will have a inpatient stay over the course of the year, they may not seek help from a, a mental health provider, 75% of the people will fill a prescription at some point during the year. So while it's not the biggest cost, it is a heavily utilized benefit, and it's a really key part of people getting better. And that's why it's really important. And often how people feel about their pharmacy benefit leads to how they feel about their insurer or the overall healthcare system. So um, you know, I always like to make that point, because a lot of times you know, when you look at the dollars, it may not be as big as hospitals and things like that, but it really is an important part of the healthcare system. All right, so um, as I mentioned, it really all starts with the patient at the bottom. Uh, right there, the patient goes to the doctor, as I mentioned, 85% of the time, if there's something wrong with them, they send them to the pharmacy to go ahead and pick up a prescription of some sort. That'd be the pharmacy there. Um, you know, and that's the part of the transaction that everybody's familiar with, right? Everyone knows that experience of going to the pharmacy, standing at the counter, pharmacist enters into the um, computer, but there's really all these mysteries of what happens from there. When the pharmacist does enter the information into the computer, what is really basically happening is the information is being transmitted between the pharmacy and what we were calling the pharmacy benefit manager, the PBM. Um, and the PBM really winds up being kind of an administrator of pharmacy claims. Uh, because there are so many pharmacies in the country and there's so many medications, it would be really hard for every single health plan to go ahead and administer all of that themselves. So, you get economies of scale by going ahead and working with pharmacy benefit manager, and that all the pharmacies are being able to tap into their data clearinghouse, right? And so the pharmacy benefit manager, after I received information from the health insurer, right, as to, we always send them every single month, we send them a file to say who's eligible, who are the Blue Cross Blue Shield members, um, MVP does the same, Medicaid does the same, all that information is held at the various um, pharmacy benefit managers. They'll go ahead and shrimp and say, yes, this is the person that's eligible with um, that insurance. Um, yeah, and they're currently an active member with them. Also, what is the copay that the person is paying or the amount on the deductible they have to go ahead and pay? As well as if they'll do a quick, um, what we call a clinical um, or a concurrent drug utilization review, which is a quick check, like a drug drug interaction. The other drugs the person has to take, this new drug cause any sort of interaction and so forth, they'll send them back an alert like that. And also if the drug requires a prior authorization. Um, if there's any sort of issues where someone has to call in to get that authorization. All that information goes back and forth between the PBM and the pharmacy within seconds. Okay? So now the pharmacy knows what the copay is, they'll collect the copay from the patient, and then they'll submit that claim to the pharmacy benefit manager for reimbursement. Okay? Now this happens 1.3 million times a year for Blue Cross Blue Shield members. Now it'll happen even more for other plans. Um, so it's very high volume of what winds up occurring. 
Um, our members, there's about 60,000 pharmacies across the country. Our members will use about 8,000 of them over the course of the year. So it's a really wide, broad network that the pharmacy benefit managers are contracting with to allow people to get easy access to their medications. Then what happens is the pharmacy benefit manager, at the end of every week, they collect all those claims that occurred for Blue Cross Blue Shield members, and they send a bill to us. Right? So we get an invoice from them for the amount of the drugs that we've contracted to go ahead and pay them. You know, there's different pricing for generic drugs, different price for brand drugs, different price for what we call specialty drugs. And they consolidate all that, they send us one invoice, we'll go ahead and uh, pay them, and then we go around and we are contracted with employers such as you know, the Teachers Union, the University of Vermont, the auto dealers, and so forth, those are our clients. We'll then go ahead and take all the claims that the PBM sends over to us, we'll consolidate them into the various billings and we send it to that employer. So, person who the patient is getting the information from or getting the insurance from would go ahead and their employer would go ahead and pay those claims. Right? Unless it's one of these systems where uh, somebody's with an exchange or they have, um, you know, it's a fully insured, then at that point they're just being billed for the premium and we're just uh, paying the claims at um, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Does that part make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then at the end of every week as well, um, they'll go ahead and reimburse the pharmacies. Um, so the money winds up going from Blue Cross Blue Shield to the PBM to the pharmacy. And that's how the pharmacies wind up being reimbursed. So they're getting part of the money from the member in terms of the copay, and the rest of the, uh, the reimbursement comes from the PBM. Okay. Now, the, the other part of it that you often hear people talk about are rebates, right? And this is another role that the pharmacy benefit manager work plays. And I'll, what rebates are, rebates are a payment from the manufacturer, right? The manufacturer are a key part of this whole model. Obviously, they produce the medications, they develop the new medications, um, they want to sell them to the wholesaler, and this wholesaler wants to sell them to the uh, pharmacy, right? So that part, we on the insurance side don't really interact with at all, you know, but that's um, a key part of the delivery of the medications system. So, um, but the manufacturers, they're obviously going about uh, manufacturing and marketing the medications. And a lot of the medications uh, within certain drug classes will be very similar. They're what we call Me Too drugs, where if one manufacturer comes out with a new drug and they find they have a $3 billion market, another manufacturer can say, well, if I came out with a very similar drug, I could go ahead and grab some market share in there and be able to make some money, so I'll come out with a drug. And then another manufacturer say, and you could wind up with a drug class that has a lot of very similar medication that have very similar um, clinical outcomes and so forth and at various prices. Okay. And the patient here doesn't really have a sense of what those different prices are, right? And they're really going to be impacted a lot by the direct consumer advertising you see on TV and so forth. Um, and so what we do is, as an insurer, we create what's called a formula. We'll go ahead and say, within this drug class, there's five different drugs. We look at the clinical outcomes, we have a pharmacy and therapeutics committee review the drugs to say, yeah, we agree that all these drugs, the clinical outcomes are very similar, we're indifferent to which ones you guys would go ahead and prefer, and we'll go ahead and look at what is the cost of the drug, right? And so when we're looking at the cost of the drug, we look at the amount that it'll be um, reimbursed for, you know, to the pharmacy, as well as a rebate that the manufacturer would be willing to pay. Right? So if a manufacturer is willing to lower the cost of the drug to the insurer by paying a rebate, then we're willing to go ahead and take a look at those five drugs that are all we're clinically indifferent to and say, we'll go ahead and put this medication on the formulary, give it a preferred status, a, call it preferred drug list, if you will, and that rebate will come back to us through the PBM. Does that part make sense? This is a, a key part of what pharmacy benefit managers do. Um, so at the end of every quarter, they go ahead and collect all the prescriptions for Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they'll submit them to the manufacturers to go ahead and collect on those rebates. So if we've decided out of those five drugs, four of them are gonna be on the formulary, and one's not gonna be on the formulary, and there's rebates to be paid on those four drugs, those, drugs, those rebates will be collected by the PBM on our behalf from the manufacturer. They then turn around and they send them to us, okay? So we get them 180 days after the end of a quarter. So prescription being filled today, the quarter will end on March 31st. We want to receive that rebate at the end of September. Right? So it's a really delayed transaction by the time we want to get it. Right? 
And this is the thing that you may have heard in the news, there's been talk about trying to move this all the way up to the point of sale. Right? So that may wind up happening. They're trying to talk about doing that legislatively. We used to offer that Blue Cross Blue Shield. We used to offer clients the opportunity to have it at the point of sale. And it wasn't popular in the marketplace, so we moved it away from it. We could always go back to it. It's not that big of a difference to us. But um, it, it wasn't popular in the marketplace because when we go to sit down with a consultant or a broker and try to explain what our pharmacy pricing is, they would um, try to compare us to other insurers or PBMs who are making bids for that employer's business. And they would get you know, the discounts on the brand, discount generic, and then the amount of the guaranteed rebate. And we were having zeros in there for the guaranteed rebate. Like, why are you paying us a rebate? Like, well, it is. It's in there at the price of sale. And I'm like, eh, if I can't see it, I don't know it's really there. And so we were losing a lot of business with it. So we stopped offering that. But we could always go back to that model. But, Brian, would yeah. you prefer that we ask questions during the presentation? Sure, or hold them absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome to stop anytime. OK, so uh, familiar with the concept of rebates. Yeah. Uh, in a, although it's a totally different world, in a previous life I owned movie theaters, and Coca-Cola would say they have the same price, regardless of who the customer was, but then we would get two forms of um, rebates. One was an advertising allowance, and one was a marketing allowance that were basically determined based on volume. And so um, my first question is, are there times when the rebates back to, to uh, the PBM would exceed the cost to Blue Cross Blue Shield because of the consumer's out-of-pocket payment. Exceed the cost to us. So such that. So let's say we go. I go to the, the pharmacy. Yeah, right. Okay. I, I think and, I yes. That and is my possible. copay is I don't know, twenty dollars. Okay. Yep. And. Um, the drug is a $40 drug. Is there a situation where the PBM would get more back in a rebate than the $20 that Blue Cross is paying for them? So, yes, but not necessarily with the copay. I, I think the situation you're thinking of is with a deductible. So, first of yes. say like a $2,000 yep. deductible is a $500 drug and there's a $100 rebate, the member could wind up paying $500 of that $500 cost of drugs $500, right? Yep. They pay that $500 and there could still be a rebate that would come back that would goes back to Blue Cross and I was saying, and then we want to funnel it back to the employer. So that is correct. That, that, that situation could occur. So you're, you're convinced that you're getting it back to the employer? Yeah, so what we do is, see, so here's one of the things that, um, the PBM has different ways that they can make money. Let me mm -hmm. just jump to that slide. All right. One of the ways that they can make money is on rebates. Okay. So when I was talking about all of the rebates that they collect from the manufacturers, when we contract with the um, pharmacy bank, one of the things that's in the contract is what percentage of the rebates that they collect that they can keep. Okay. We go ahead and say when we're doing every three years we do an RFP for these PBM services, right? And one of the things that we say in our RFP is that if you're going to bid on our business, one of the minimum requirements in our contract is that you have to give us 100% of every single revenue that comes from the manufacturer to the pharmacy benefit. Okay? Then we turn around and we give that to the employer. And the reason why that's important to us is because a generic drug is always cheaper than a brand drug, even if the brand drug has a rebate. Okay? And so, I always want to encourage the use of generic drugs. That's the best way to try and control pharmacy costs. If I'm giving the pharmacy benefit manager an incentive where they're keeping, like, say, 10% of the rebates and they're making money on the rebates, and the rebates are only paid on brand drugs, now I'm giving them a financial incentive to go ahead and encourage the use of brand drugs when I'm better off than people taking the generic drug, right? So we make it such that to the point, like I said, we require 100% of the rebates and any other revenue streams from the manufacturer. There, there could be administrative costs that the manufacturer is paying to the PBM. We want 100% of that too. And then we require um, complete audit rights of the PBM, right? So we can go in and read every single contract that they have with the manufacturer. And is that true of your competitors too? I can't speak to it. I don't know if Susan would be able to speak to it. 
my guess, you know, so insurance companies, this is what we do all day. I mean, like I said, I got 20 years of dealing with this. Like, so this is what, when you spend that much time doing it, you kind of have to know your, who you're buying from inside and out, and you really have to be sophisticated in buying that. Um, you wouldn't wind up in my position or in a position without being somewhat knowledgeable what you need to have out of contract. So I suspect that they do. But it, it probably gets a little different when you're a direct, if you're an employer down here, some employers will go ahead and contract directly with the PBM and rather than through an insurer. And in those situations, there's a chance that someone doesn't have the experience of buying from a PBM and they may allow the PBM to make money on rebates, which I would discourage anyone from doing that. They also may not ask for full audit rights. And that would be something I would definitely discourage somebody from, or I would encourage them to always have full audit rights. You, know, you really want to be able to go in there, go through all the contracts, go through every single claim, really identify what money was being generated and make sure that they're adhering to the contract. And if you're not able to get those audit rights, be worried that something could be up. So when you, you have that uh, transaction between the uh, PBM and the pharmacy, um, as somebody that's worked in the industry for all these years on both sides of it, um, do you have concerns when you have things like CVS Caremark and alliances like that? Where CVS Caremark owns their own, or CVS owns their own yes. PBM? Yeah, it's, it's not so much a concern as I am, it's another model that I have to be aware of. So if you contract with CVS, and we do contract with CVS for um, Medicaid, or not Medicaid, Medicare, sorry. Uh, our Medicare Part D lives go through CVS. Our commercial lives go through Express Scripts, right? So in that case, you have to know that part of their model of having a PBM is that they want to encourage use of their retail stores, right? The retail pharmacies want to make more margin than the PBM business, so they want to try and encourage use of that. And you have to make a determination, is that really in your own best interest? And so it's something that you have to be aware of, um, and then make sure you have any sort of contractual protections that you need through that process. So, um, for me personally, I have more concern with the consolidation industry or insurers buying PBMs, which is leaving, comes like Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont without its own PBM, having a contract with another competitive insurer, like Cigna buying Express Scripts. I now have to, you know, have to contract with Cigna to have services from Express Scripts, so my competitor is now also my partner. Kind of weird, right? So, has anybody ever explored like the Sherman antitrust laws and things like that when it comes to those uh, acquisitions? So those things will, they've gone through the FTC or the Judiciary you know, Department of uh, Justice. Um, so they've been reviewed in Washington and they've been allowed to go through. I mean, this gets into like a federal level discussion as yep. opposed to the local level. And um, you know, if you look at the top three PBMs, they probably have about two-thirds of the market at this point between uh, CBS, Express Scripts, and Optum, RX, which is part of United Health. And if you look at those three, Cigna is, owns um, Express Scripts, CBS owns Aetna, or is about to be owned Aetna, and then Optum is owned by United Health Group. So if you want to be with one of the big three to get the most negotiating power, you have to basically, as an insurer, contract with another insurer, in essence. And that's more what I have a little weird problem with. And, but if you're in this industry long enough, you see these things kind of go cycles. Back in the 90s, uh, manufacturers were buying the PBM. So the manufacturer was saying, oh, well, if I bought the PBM, then I could go ahead and rather than paying a rebate on it, I could go ahead and have control over the formula that the PBM is putting out there, right? And so they were trying that model in the 90s. And then that lasted for about a decade. And then the end of the 90s, you, you go back and look at it and see they started spinning them all off. The shareholders started saying, you know what, we think that there's value to a independent PBM that we're not really getting that value as a consolidated pharmaceutical manufacturer and PBM. So I wouldn't be surprised if we'll go through a period of about 10 years and all of a sudden you'll see all these insurers start spinning off the PBMs with this shareholders go, you know what, I really think there's more value if we saw a pure play PBM and a pure play insurer as opposed to a bundle. We'll see what happens. But. So on that same line of questioning on the PBM, did you take a look at the proposal that came from some of the retail druggists in the state that basically said, um, we're not seeing full transparency in the PBMs. What if the state did a, a program similar to what they do with liquor control where they had their own um, PBM, basically yep. a purchaser uh, or a distributor, whatever you want to call it, right. um, and 
And that way there would be complete transparency and they would, they would cut out the, the profits from the middleman. Because you, you tend, I mean, if you turn on Mad Money at night, you see Jim Cramer talking about the, the profits out of PBM and why it's a good idea to buy the stock. And, and uh, so obviously there's money that's being taken out of the system that doesn't stay in the system. So did, did you give that um, proposal any uh, review? Yeah, so I, I met with, um, I, it came from Jeff Hochberg from yeah. Brother Farms. Yeah, I met with Jeff and also um, the gentleman from, I think it was H.P. Smith or D.H. Smith. Um, they're the wholesaler that um, Jeff was talking about this plan with their original wholesaler, I think out of Maine. So I sat down and met with them and we went through the model. And when we went through it, um, they, the model they presented, we still would have to contract with a PBM. So we would still have a PBM that would still be a processor of the claim, right? And um, when we went through, I asked the gentleman from, I think it's H.D. Smith, um, said, you know, so is your margin going to be smaller through this? And he goes, no, we're going to make the same money. And I asked, you know, Jeff wanted to be paid a fixed fee rather sure. than <laughs> making a spread on I said, Jeff, are you going to make less money? And he goes, no. I said, and I guarantee you the PBM, when I sell the contract with them, they're still going to want to make the same margin. So I'm not sure where the savings are coming from. Granted, we get more transparency, right? But um, if there's no difference in the actual money, right, what do we really gain? So here's the point I always make with transparency, is that when we go ahead and we contract, let me go back to this, um, going back to how they make money, um, they make, Pharmacy Benefit Managers can make money one of two ways, the, the top two ways with regards to processing claims. One is called traditional spread pricing, and one is called pass-through pricing, okay? And the traditional spread pricing means when they go ahead and they reimburse the pharmacy, they're reimbursing them at a lower rate than what they're charging us, right? So if it's a $100 drug, and, or the you know, list price is say $100, and they uh, are contracted with us for a 17% discount, and they contract with the pharmacy at an 18% discount, they keep that 1% differential, right? That margin in between. And that's how they make their money with the discount spread, right? With a pass-through, you whatever they're reimbursing their ph the pharmacy for, that's exactly what they charge Blue Cross Blue Shield or whoever it would be, right? But you then pay an administrative fee for each claim. It might be like a dollar forty or something along those lines, right? So when we go ahead and do our RFP, we ask them to bid it both ways. I say, you know, give me a, your best pricing with regards to a spread arrangement and the versus the best pricing through a pass-through arrangement. And then we'll go ahead and do the analysis to see which one's um, lower cost for our merchants. Because at the end of the day, the thing I care the most about, I'm agnostic as to how they make their money, but what I really care about is getting the lowest cost for our clients, for the employers. I want to lower the cost of medicine as much as possible. So we'll go ahead and do the analysis, and if the spread pricing yields a lower price, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. I can't go back to the employers. I can't go to UVM and say, look, I got you this great deal on pass-through pricing. It's really transparent, but it's going to cost you three million dollars more, right? They're like, well, that's great, but I'm going to have to cut some UVM staff because I got that transparency, right? If I can get transparency and it's the lowest cost, that's great. It's a nice extra to have. But the number one priority for me is to keep that cost as low as possible. So if the model that they're offering that gives me the lowest price is a discount spread, I'll go ahead and choose that one. And same thing, my same point is to, when I met with Jeff and the wholesaler, was when I go and do my next RFP, I welcome them to go ahead and make a bid. And if the model that they're offering is a lower price than what I'm getting from Express Scripts or CBS or anybody, I'll gladly sign up for it. I, you know, I'm not sold on any sort of model. I'll do whatever it takes to lower the cost. I just don't want have to like be locked into only one model and then there's some other option out there that I don't have access to and I can't get that lower pricing, right? So that's the feeling always with transparency. I mean, you know, it is nice to have, but it's not ultimately in the end the number one interest for our clients to get that cost as low as possible. So the one other question I had yeah. that you already talked about, you talked about formularies and prior OS, and I was yeah. just curious what percentage of prior OS for prescriptions only get denied? Um, I have to go back and look at the latest data, but it's somewhere around in the 10 to 12 percent range. Yeah. So there's not that many scripts that wind up 
requiring a prior authorization. So I think what we're, like I said, we do about 1.3 million scripts. I think we had about 8,000 prior auths. So just to give you a sense of order of magnitude, and of that 8,000, you know, you're talking about the number of ones that are denial, about 10, maybe 10 to 15%, somewhere in that range, um, is what's being denied from the prior authorization. So in the scope of everything, it's a small percentage of that 1.5%. <coughs> So in a previous board meeting a few months ago, uh, there was a discussion about the possibility of a gold card program. Yeah. Does um, prescription follow the same trends in, in that some doctors uh, are never denied or not? <laughs> um, so there are some doctors that are denied less often. And we are looking into gold card programs. Um, okay. We, we've been uh, having meetings around different programs. The thing you often hear about the most noise about prior authorizations from uh, primary care physicians. Right, the administrative right. burden to them. But when we look at the data, they have a much higher denial rate than specialists. Specialists are the ones who would most likely want to get a gold card in that, right? So they'd be kind of in the same situation where primary care physicians, being a generalist, you have to know about so many different drugs. Yeah. A specialist may have one class, maybe two classes of drugs that they have to keep track of everything, and they're gonna know those drugs inside and out. It's really much harder to be a generalist, and so that's where you wind up um, having a higher denial rate because they're just not as familiar with you know, all of the different changing indications on medications, you know, different studies that have come out, so it's harder in their situation. I think that there's well, that's why we were wondering at that uh, meeting if, if it wouldn't be an incentive if you had the gold card program for, for providers to step up their game to try to make sure that uh, they're not ever in the situation that they would uh, be denied because they would want to uh, be able to achieve that gold card status. Yeah, and that's a, a possibility, and we're looking at it. But we're, I'm in agreement that I would like to find a way to reduce the administrative burden. You know, one of the things that we did, we were taking a look at we used to have prior authorization have to be renewed every single year, right? And we took a look at it and I said, what happens on those renewals? What's the denial rate? And the denial rate is only like 3% on renewals of a prior authorization. So we said, what would happen if rather than having a one year prior authorization, we went out to three year prior authorizations, right? And we'd actually wind up saving money because of the cost of having to do fewer reviews. Plus, the fact of the matter is that you're now going that, you know, when the doctor starts someone on therapy, they do the prior authorization, then they're skipping the year one anniversary, the year two anniversary, and just having the year three, right? So you now go from four authorizations over that time period to two. So you're gonna have a 50% reduction without having to have any sort of change in the cost savings associated with utilization management. And you know, those kind of things are what I think we should all be working towards trying to find. And if gold card is part of it, we're willing to go there. Um, I don't want to get rid of prior authorizations altogether because just on pharmacy alone, we save about $17 million a year on prior authorizations, right? Um, for those 8,000 scripts. And if you take the 8,000. Does that net out, though, the, the cost of the doctors that uh, have an extra staff person or have uh, right. uh, head, headsets with uh, people that are making calls trying to get the uh, authorizations and things so like that? When I look at <coughs> primary care physicians, yep. right, the primary care physician who has the heaviest volume in the state for requesting prior authorizations from Blue Cross Blue Shield is one per week. I don't think they're hiring somebody for pharmacy prior association to handle one to us per week, right? It's not, if there's a, a huge burden on pharmacy from Blue Cross Blue Shield, I'd really like to sit down with them and talk to them because when I look at the data, there's not that huge one. But if I look at an aggregate, right, and say like over all the thousands of providers, right, I got 8,000 per year, and I say that it takes 15 minutes to get a prior authorization. And then I would say that's, you know, so it's 2,000 hours. And say it's, you know, somebody's time's worth $100 an hour. You're, you're talking about $200,000, right? I'm not sure if my math is working in my head, but it's somewhere right around $200,000 in terms of cost of people's time to do that. That is yielding $17 million in savings, right? If there was some other healthcare reform idea where we could get that kind of an ROI, we would sign up for it immediately, right? Let's not do away with a home run of a cost savings opportunity because of the burden. Let's work to try and reduce that burden, but not get rid of cutting out all that waste out of the system. Right. So, um, you know, I, I'd be happy to come back and 
go deeper into prioritization and kind of go through the process and so forth. But um, this is my general feeling is that let's work towards reducing the burden without getting rid of entirely. Goal carding would certainly be a part of it. Um, you know, you also, there's some other things that are around technology-wise that having the prior authorization process built more into the electronic medical records of the doctor. So immediately on the screen, they see what the cost of the medication is and the opportunity to do the prior authorization review right then and there. Those kind of things could reduce the burden without having to do away with the same option. Other than the formulary, does Blue Cross do any counter detailing with docs so that they're getting better information as to what the, the best cost alternatives are? Yeah, we do. Um, and we started our program specifically for that kind of detail. Um, we have a pharmacist, uh, her name is Carrie Lacombe, she lives in Moncton, and her job is solely, she travels around the state visiting with doctors to go ahead and inform them of you know, new generic drugs coming out on the market, answer our changes to our clinical programs, answer their questions like, if we go ahead and have a change in formulary or a change in prior authorization that's going to impact some members, we'll give Carrie the list of the patients and their prescribers. And so she can go out there and say, hey, you know, doctor, here's a list of patients that are going to be impacted. Here's what the suggested therapeutic alternatives are. Do you have any clinical questions about it? And so forth. So um, she goes out and does that to try and, you know, really start out with just trying to push back against the direct consumer advertising and direct to physician advertising as well. Um, but it's really worked into just a general resource for doctors to be able to tap into. They, they'd rather talk to a clinician like Carrie than they would hear some sort of bureaucrat like myself. So it's worked out well. Great. Yeah. I have a question around the audit. Yeah. Sure. Um, so when you, in your contract, negotiate the full audit, right? You yeah. would do that regardless of what kind of financial arrangement, right? Correct. So. Um, so regardless of whether it's a discount spread or the past, yep. uh, can you talk a little bit about like how often you might so, exercise those audit rights and how that works? So we, pharmacy benefit management contracts are typically three years um, you know, in length and every three years doing our thing. Uh, I always see it as only like spring house cleaning, you know, at the end of that contract, that's when I uh, do my audits. So I'll go back and audit that contract, that contract period. You know, it's expensive for me to hire somebody to go out and do that audit. Um, you know, quite often it'll want to pay for itself because out of, you know, we do $170 million a year times three, you're over $500 million. And, um, you know, it cost me, you know, it still cost me $100,000 to complete that. And if they find 1% off, you know, it's still, it's usually a fraction of that. It's usually like, you know, three or $400,000 off. It's like a fraction of a fraction of a percent. But it, it pays for itself, but it's still a lot of money to go ahead and do. And I don't want to have to spend it every single year. Um, so I tend to do it once every three years, with the exception of if something does go <coughs> kind of bluey. Um, a couple years ago, when Express Scripts bought Medco, they transitioned all the Express Scripts clients over on Medco's claims platform. And the transition didn't go as they wished, and there was a bunch of noise and problems with the setup and everything. And I chose at the end of that, that lasted from like beginning of June to the end of October. And I chose to have an audit done specifically for that time period. Uh, you know, because I was just like really concerned about what happened during that transition. And so that would be an exception where if there's something that just really goes sideways, I want to have that period isolated and examined with everyone fresh in minds as what the transition was occurring. All right. Um, well, uh, let's just finish off the last way that the PBS make money. It's not a float. Um, the idea there is that when I was talking about the timing of the payments, so they send an invoice to us, we go ahead and pay them, and then they pay the pharmacy, right? If they sit on that money between receiving it from us and paying the pharmacies, they can make money on that, right? And you don't think like collecting interest is really all valuable, but Express Scripts will do $100 billion a year, and you sit on $100 billion for one week, the interest on that, it's a lot of money, right? Um, now, Vermont, though, has taken steps to cut back on that. It used to be that they would pay pharmacies like once a month, right? And it was really a cash flow issue for pharmacies. Um, and it used to be that we would pay them every two weeks. Now, they, uh, you guys passed, um, or I should say the legislature passed some prompt pay laws that say that the pharmacy benefit manager has to pay the pharmacy every single week, 
right? So that helps with the cash flow there. And we change it just independently that where we want to be invoiced every single week because with the invoice comes all the claims file and we can update um, the health savings account vendors that we work with to let them know that people have had these claims more frequently. So it's just for a little wonky reason we switch one week as well. So there's no more float being made for Blue Cross Blue Shield for Vermont members, but it's quite possible for other people if they're um, paying the PBM and then PBM is sitting on that money before they pay in other states, they can make money on the float there as well. So those are tend to be the ways that they make money on it. All right, why do we bother contracting with PBMs? As I mentioned earlier, uh, there's economies of scale aspect of it. Um, there's 60,000 pharmacies, there's dozens and dozens of manufacturers, there are complex contracts. Uh, I don't have the resources. Our entire pharmacy department is myself and a pharmacist who works for me. I'm not a pharmacist. I have a uh, lady by the name Rita Bagnini, she does a great job managing the clinical aspect of our benefit. Um, but we wouldn't have the wherewithal, the manpower to be able to do that. And it'd be silly for every single insurer to employ an entire army of people to go out and do all the contracts. So um, also investing in all of the um, infrastructure needed to go ahead and do the claims processing for all that, it, it would be very So it makes for economies of scale. But the other aspect of it is negotiating value, right? So Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, oops, um, we are a large insurer in the state of Vermont, right? But Vermont's a small state. We're 600,000 people, um, you know, another place where they would call us a county, right? Um, but when you go nationwide, Express Scripts, uh, they have, like I mentioned, we have 1.3 million claims, you know, about $170 million of drug spend. Express Scripts, they have 1.4 billion claims and $100 billion of drug spend. When they show up to negotiate, with Wegmans or um, with uh, Walgreens or um, you know Glaxo, Smith Klein, Merck, or something like that, they're bringing so much more heft to those negotiations than we would ever. They're able to get better pricing on our behalf than we would have otherwise. Right? And the same thing with Caremark. You look at their volume; they're getting uh, larger and larger. Um, Optum, you know, they have all United Health Group's volume. Plus, they're out there now selling their services separately, so um, they have uh, large volume as well. So um, those are reasons why you want to contract the economies of scale and the volume that they bring. Uh, what services they provide, we've been talking a lot about the claims processing, but they do do other services as well. Um, the patient safety edits, as I mentioned, the drug-drug interactions, they check um, as the claims come through. Uh, formulary management, we have two formularies we offer our clients. One is an express script formulary, and one is our own formulary. So, um, different clients want different things, uh, so we have to be able to offer a variety. Once again, for the two of us, it would be a lot to manage multiple formulas. We can manage one. We have local um, input from local doctors and so forth, but for some clients that don't really care about that local input, they just want a different kind of formula, and that's what um, we use Express Script Formula Management for. Uh, nationwide pharmacy contracting, manufacturing rebate contracting, um, e-prescribing hub, so uh, Vermont's actually doing pretty well at e-prescribing. The vast majority of scripts these days are coming in electronically, and um, PBMs are a part of that. Mail order pharmacy, we haven't talked about that at all. Um, uh, it's, in addition to being a pharmacy benefit manager, they're also pharmacies. They're some of the largest pharmacies in the entire country, right? Because they do this mail order volume. Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont doesn't encourage the use of it. We don't discourage it either. We make it available to members, but we only have about 5% of our scripts that go through mail order. It's there for a convenient factor. People in rural areas may not have as easy time getting to a pharmacy. People up in Grand Isle, I think they only have um, one pharmacy left up in that area. So sometimes mail order works better for them. Right? Um, especially drug pharmacies. Uh, especially drugs are high cost, high touch medications, often injectables, treating rare conditions. Very expensive medications. Pharmacy requires special handling, some extra care um, that's given to the people. I have nurses and pharmacists contact the members to help with that. They provide a social pharmacy that members can use. Customer service, our, um, uh, we have a customer service here at Blue Cross, but they also have customer service at um, down in St. Mary's, Georgia for Express Scripts. And they're open 24 7, 365. Those are broader hours than we keep, so they're able to go ahead and provide a service for a pharmacy. Um, prior approvals, we've talked about the academic detailing, you know, the counter detailing we were talking about, we offer that. Um, Data integration, you know, they take our medical claims as well and they feed that into the you know, claims processing part of it. 
Uh, account management, you know, they uh, have a team of people that help manage our account. Market development, they help us with our sales, our RFPs that we do for the people who are buying our services from us. Product waste abuse programs, as well as um, just general um, data analytics and trend analysis. So there's a lot that pharmacy bank managers do that are able to provide us with um, value and benefit. So a couple questions before you yeah. go. On the nationwide pharmacy network contracting, do each one of the major PBMs have their own network, or is it like uh, when you're booking a hotel room, you may have booked it through Hotwire, but there isn't a kayak platform? So they all have multiple different networks. And they, so they all have what would be referred to as a broad nationwide network, right? So all the PBMs will contract with just about Unless it's like some sort of weird small compounding farms that just doesn't want to deal with insurance whatsoever, but that's going to be a, a rare exception. The vast majority of 60,000 farms across the country are going to contract with every PBM, right? And so they all have their broad network that everything is the same, right? And then you get into the other options again. You can have a more restricted network where you can say um, you don't want to have this certain chain included in the network. For a long time, Blue Cross Blue Shield didn't have um, Walgreens in its network. The reason being is that there was only three Walgreens in Vermont. We had very small volume on them. And by removing Walgreens from the network, the other network, the other pharmacies are willing to give deeper discounts. <coughs> so by going ahead and removing a large national player with small impact on our population, we were able to get better pricing for our members. Right? So we had them removed for a long time. Until they bought a whole bunch of Rite Aids in Vermont recently. They bought 31 Rite Aids or something like that. And there's no way I could have a network. There's 140 pharmacies in Vermont, so I can't have a network without 31 of them. Right? So we included Walgreens back in last September. Okay. Um, so now we have that back. But you can go ahead and get those restricted networks. And then there's also, like CBS does things, as you were mentioning earlier, about steering people to their stores. They'll go ahead and offer incentive that um, steers people to CBSs. They'll talk to um, people that have a tiered copay, so that people have lower copay if they use a CBS and so forth. Because they want to get you in the door so that you're buying all the things that are not you know, beyond medication. They want you to buy your Kit Kats, Bud Light Lime, and you know, photo process. And they'll give you coupons to keep coming back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that's their model. And um, you know, that's one of the top things for the local independents to try and compete with, right? Because you go into a local independent, it doesn't look like a small grocery store, which if you go into a CBS or a Walgreens, you know, it looks like a small grocery store. And that's really where they, they want to get that foot traffic through the door. So um, they want people to go and use the pharmacy in the back of the store, and while they're passing through, buy some more shampoo and things like that. And that's where they make the larger margin. So if you don't have that stuff to sell in the front, it's harder to compete with those um, chains. That's why you see a lot of the independent pharmacies selling to the chains as they, they pharmacies get older and retire and so forth. We saw in Montpelier, you know, uh, Rich Harvest sold to um, uh, Kinney's. Okay. So, um, so, so on that same slide, the mail order pharmacy. Yeah. Um, what are the Blue Cross rules? Um, I know I've had a lot of complaints over the years from people who um, it's cheaper for them to get a 90-day supply through the mail order um, because their out-of-pocket is reduced, right. and yet they only need it for, right. say, 28 days, but it's still cheaper for them. Do you take any steps so that you're not in that scenario where somebody's getting 90 days of a product that they only need 28 days of? So, that, I think they would be mistaken in that situation. So, the way that the traditional idea of a mail order incentive is that you allow them, there's typically one copay per 30 days, right? So, you can go to a local pharmacy, you get 90 days supply, and you're gonna pay three copays, right? So, your copay is $20 per month, but not if you get it through the mail. But if you get it through the mail, you're gonna pay two copies, right? So that's the, the, the incentive often, is that you're gonna save by not having to pay three copies, you're gonna pay two copies, right? But if someone's getting a 28 day supply at a local pharmacy, you're gonna pay one copay, and if you go to mail order, you're, you're not gonna pay less than one copay. You're still gonna pay at least two copies. The only time it would be cheaper is if a person has a deductible, right, where if, they are getting a 20 day supply at both places, and the discounts are deeper, or there's larger discounts at the pharmacy, at the mail order pharmacy. It would be cheaper for a person out, but that's only if you're comparing 28 to 28 days. There's no way that the discounts aren't so much better that a 90 day supply would be less expensive than a 28 day supply at the retail. So that's 
So I think, you know, I, I would need a specific situation, but. The next time I get an email, I'll send you that. Yeah, please do. I, I'm always happy to dig into these. Um, the other thing, though, is that what has really happened is that it used to be a much larger gap between the discounts at a retail pharmacy and a mail order pharmacy. And that's when a lot of those incentives were put in place to go ahead and incentive use mail order. If you look at the discounts these days, it's not as large enough. There is still a difference, but it's not as large. And it's to the point where, in order to actually break even on incenting people to go to mail order, you have to have them pay 2.7 copays at mail order. And nobody wants a plan design that says, oh, you're going to pay 2.7 copays, right? It's moronic. No one can really follow that. So, really, what points are happening these days is most people, like our entire exchange population and a lot of groups, they've just gone to say, if you want to use mail order, you're going to pay three copays there. If you're going to go to a retail pharmacy, you're going to pay three copays for a 90 day supply. Either way, it's the exact thing. You're not going to have a financial savings. It's just a convenience factor um, for using mail order at that point. And what do yep. you say about the complaints that retail, retail pharmacists will say that? Um, they're being squeezed all the time by the push for mail order and that it's taking um, some quality away from the patient care because when they in the old days when they came up the pharmacists knew everything that they were getting and they could counsel them against counterindicative medicines and things like that but those days uh, are seem to be waning so what do you say to that argument um i i can send over data that shows that as far back i can pull data i think back to 2001 out of our database and it is varied between 4% and 5% of our claims that entire time. Um, we are not seeing that increase in mail order. That, I think other states may have seen that, but we are not doing that here, and I don't think our competitors are um, with regards to mail order. And the issue for independent pharmacies is really they're losing out to the chains. If I, I have this one graph back in my office that shows a market share broken out between chain pharmacies, mail order, and independent pharmacies. And when I started Blue Cross a um, decade plus ago, the independents were around 30%, and that slipped down to almost 20%. And mail order has been about the same, and the difference has been chains have grown. And that's going back to what I was talking about before, is that chains have a different model for making money than the independents. Um, you go into a, a chain, like I said, they're selling you all these other things other than pharmacy, and that's where they can make their money, right? So they're willing to go ahead and basically break even on the pharmacy and the back of the store just to get the foot traffic through to go ahead and make that money. But if an independent doesn't have all those other things, and they still have to match those prices to be in a network, that becomes really hard for them. So the, the economics of pharmacy has shifted on them and it's not easy for those independents to go ahead and invest in a large of a space and all that inventory to go ahead and have all that um, for different you know, independent stores. So that's really what has been happening with the independents. They've been losing out to the, far, the chains rather than mail order. They just you know, have far market share. Now, the exception to that just recently, we have started, going back to when I was talking about specialty drugs, we are now, for our exchange population, we're requiring them to use a specialty pharmacy, okay? Um, and so that is a change where we are moving people over to a specialty pharmacy for that. The reason being that the largest area that we're seeing cost increases is on specialty drugs. It, the, the trend is so far beyond anything else in healthcare. We're trying to find any sort of possible solution to try to control that cost, and the discounts at a specialty pharmacy are much greater. Now, one of the things that we've been doing is um, local pharmacies are allowed to go ahead and participate in that network. They can be classified as a specialty pharmacy and be part of that exclusive specialty pharmacy network. Um, University of Rome Medical Center, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, um, and uh, some other local pharmacies I've been working with Express Scripts to go ahead and get credentials as a specialty pharmacy to be a part of that as well. So that is somewhere, if someone wants to make a point that you know we are trying to drive specialty pharmacy use, to certain stores, yes, that is true. That we're starting to do that as a way to try to control costs on the specialty drugs. There's no question about that. But in terms of mail order, that has not been an issue. And that's relatively new start of that specialty pharmacy part. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I like that. So, real quick, about the pharmacy margins. Um, if you look at the supply chain, you know, going from the manufacturers, the um, pharmacies themselves, the pharmacy benefit managers, 
and I just pulled the 2008 SEC filings for each one and take a look at where money's being made. You know, Express Scripts is obviously our PBM, they're a large player in the state. They have about 8.5% um, margin before overhead, after overhead, they're looking at about 3.3. Uh, Walgreens, the largest pharmacy chain in the state now, they have gross margin at 23.4%. Uh, they have a lot of overhead with all the store locations. That eats up a lot of um, their costs, their margin, so forth. So they get down to around 3.8% margin as well. Typically for business in the United States, you look at you know expected net income margin of in the 5 to 8% range. So those are actually on the lower side, which gives you a sense that there's a lot of competitive pressure against them to go ahead and they're not making money hand over fist. If you take a look at Amgen, um, you know, manufacturer of specialty drugs, you know, we were having these very high cost uh, trends on. Their gross margin before it is 63.9%, and after all their overhead, all their R&D expenses, all their marketing expenses, they're still making 30.7%. And this isn't just an aberration of those ones. This is pretty consistent throughout the market that pharmaceutical manufacturers is where the meat is, right? That's where, if you're talking about high cost of drugs, that's where the, most of the money is being made. You know, and I understand people are getting confused about like what is that PBMs do is kind of like this weird business and everything. But when I look at um, where money could be saved, it's really the manufacturers that have the most control and are holding the largest part of the market, um, most of the profits in this market. Any questions about that? All right. Um, all right. So how how are we doing on time? About half an hour. Is that right? Okay. We're so um, fascinated, we're just going to let you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Stop me at any point. Um, all right, now the question is always, how are prescription drugs priced? Um, and different uh, drugs get different amount of pricing, but first just the level set, what are the different categories of drugs? just want to clarify uh, brand drugs, generic drugs, and specialty drugs. Those are really the three I never often think about. Um, brand drugs are drugs that um, have been uh, brought to the market, but they still have a patent protection. You know, patent law can be around 17 years. It may take 10 years from the time that they file the patent to the time they actually reach the market. There's a lot of money gets spent into uh, research and development, clinical trials, and so forth. That leaves them about seven years when it's in the market and they have patent protection, um, and so forth. And that's the time when they can really make their money. That represents about 12% of prescriptions. It's about 30% of overall cost. Generic drugs are the ones that are most commonly used. Uh, these are drugs where the drug has reached that point, the patent has expired, Multiple manufacturers can now come into the market. We have a really good competitive generic drug market in the United States. Generic drugs are often cheaper or regularly cheaper in the United States than they are in Canada. Canada has cheaper brand drugs. We have cheaper uh, generic drugs. We should get together and build ourselves a model. Um, and so that represents about 86. It's kind of growing stuff though, almost like you know 87% of all prescriptions. But it's only about 20% of the cost because those are the lowest cost drugs. Right? They, uh, like I said, it's really competitive. and. These are the ones that you often will hear, um, like Walmart talk about their $4 generic drugs deal. That was a really great piece of marketing because the fact matters that a lot of generic drugs are all right at $4, right? And they were just patching them all together and saying they're gonna sell them for $4. Um, lastly, specialty drugs. This is a subset of um, brand drugs. As I mentioned, these are often drugs that are um, require extra special care handling. There can be um, temperature sensitivity to them. They can often require um, some to do self-injections with them and everything. They treat uh, rare conditions or uncommon conditions often. And these are the ones that are, it's up to 50% of the cost. So going back to when I started Blue Cross in 2007, they were about 8% of cost. And now it's grown to about 50%. And it's still only 2% of prescriptions. So a very small percentage of the number of people that actually ever fill a specialty drug. These would be treating like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, hepatitis C, things along those lines, cancer medications, um, but it's 50% of the cost. So this is really where um, a lot of our focus has been, trying to control costs lately. Um, so any questions about the differentials there? All right, so when we look at our pricing, our, our contract with uh, pharmacy benefit managers, so this is what we see as an insurer, right? There's the average wholesale price, which is the list price of the medication. Then we'll go ahead and negotiate a discount for what that, uh, off of the AWP. AWP is a price that is set by a company called Medispan, which is owned by a massive company called Walters Kluwer. 
and they are the only one out there that sets AWP, and it winds up becoming an industry standard. There's a couple other ones. There's a thing called weighted or um, wholesale acquisition costs (WAC). There's also ASP, average sales price, for dealing with PBMs. The standard is use average wholesale price. Um, so. We might negotiate something like a 16% discount. That gets down to what we call an ingredient cost of like $84, right? Then the pharmacy also gets paid a dispensing fee, which is a flat dollar amount per claim. It's about a dollar. Um, gives you down to what we call a gross cost of $85. Um, the member will then pay their copay deductible, and then that brings down to a plan cost. And then rebates are often in aggregate about 6% of the average wholesale price. So figure about six dollars and bring down fifty four dollars. The tricky part when you look at all this is that somebody will say, well what's the cost of the drug? Right? And say, I'm really upset about cost drug. Well which cost are you talking about? Are you talking about this net cost at the end where I'm getting that rebate 180 days later? Is it the plan cost here? Is it what the member would be paying without the deductible of the eighty five or with the deductible of eighty five dollars or is it the twenty five dollars copay that the member is upset about? So this is what makes it really hard when we have discussions around the cost of medications, because it's, at what point are we talking about the cost of medication? The average wholesale price, one, ends up largely being set by the manufacturers, right? And so the PBMs have, and the insurers have influence over the discount, the dispensing fee, and the rebate, because those are parts of negotiating that part. Um, you know, the deductible, or the member copay, is really set by the employer. So the, whoever our client is, is going about making those choices. So. It can be really challenging for someone stepping into this world trying to figure out what is the cost drug because it can be different amounts at different points in the, in the process. Um, if it's a pass-through arrangement, as I mentioned before, that, that also includes an administrative fee. So you can add that onto it and it gets a slightly higher level of complexity. So when I was talking earlier about spread pricing, as I mentioned, there's like two models. There's the one right here, the pass-through with the PBM, where we pay that administrative fee and that's where the PBM makes some money, or the spread pricing. And this would be an example where, you know, we, I just walked through our example of our pricing here, but there's also the pricing that the pharmacy benefit manager has with Walgreens, okay? And so for their reimbursement. So once again, it could be $100 on the AWP, but now rather than a 16% discount or we're, we paid them $84, the PBM may turn around paying the pharmacy $83, okay? And where I paid them a dollar per script for the dispensing fee, it may actually be contracted at 50 cents with Walgreens, which means that rather than I'm paying the PBM $85, it's $83.50, which ultimately comes down to a dollar fifty spread on that PB, on the PBM margin, okay? So once again, going back to the complexity, when people say, what is the cost of the drug? Now we're not looking at just this, we're also looking at is this the cost of drug over here? It can all get very complex and it makes it challenging to go ahead and do this. Does that help at all or just make it money? So, all, right. all right, this is typically the explanation around um, in general, right? But then it gets a little different with generic drugs. Generic drugs have a thing called MAC poison and um, MAC stands for maximum allowable cost. As I mentioned, we have a pretty robust generic drug market in the country. That means that when a drug does come off patent, there's usually a six month specific period for one manufacturer to go ahead and produce a drug, right? Just to encourage somebody to enter into the generic drug market. But then after that six month exclusivity period is up, anybody can go ahead and make a drug, right? So the idea of MAC pricing is that rather than have all these different manufacturers out there with all these different prices for these generic drugs, the MAC price goes ahead and sets a schedule for what will be reimbursed for that drug, regardless of what that manufacturer's price is. Okay. So like, this is an example for um, fluconazole. Okay, the exact same drug, <coughs> fluconazole the whole way up and down, same strength, 100 uh, milligrams, oral tablet, right? These are all the exact same. These are all the different manufacturers are making fluconazole 100 milligram oral tablet, right? But if you look over here at what their um, adjusted unit price is, it can vary wildly, you know, significantly from one end to the other, okay? So the idea of MAC pricing is rather than having all of a sudden claims for the exact same drug, you know, when it gets approved as a generic, it has the same molecule and has to be absorbed into the body at the same rate, right? So, so clinically, these are all identical to each other. So rather than like 
Blue Cross Blue Shield is saying, oh, well, sometimes we'll reimburse at $36, sometimes it'll be $8.70, sometimes it'll be $24. We want to go ahead and say, sort them all by cost and say, you know what, the cheapest one there is the one from DRX at $8.75, and we're going to reimburse at that. You can go ahead and buy from any manufacturer you want, but the fact of the matter is that we're going to reimburse at $8.75, right? And that's the idea of what MAC pricing is trying to do. So that by putting that in place, then the other manufacturer, they better lower their prices if they ever want to go ahead and be competitive and try and sell them. Right? And then that process will keep on happening. Somebody will all of a sudden jump the price on DRX and uh, may reset the MAC price at a certain point to say, oh, that's the new, what the price should be. So it's a way to go ahead and use all the different competitors that are out there to try and make the best buying decision by going ahead and setting that MAC price up. And so, because this happens so often, and then PBM is the one that's going about um, managing the MAC price, we wind up negotiating there an average discount off of generics, right? Off of AWP for generic drugs. So, they'll go ahead and give me a guarantee. They'll say, we'll guarantee you that it's going to be an 80% discount on all your generics when you add them all together. Because there's going to be some that's going to be a 30% discount, some are going to be a 90% discount, some are going to be a 75% discount. But when you take them all in aggregate, We'll guarantee it'll be 80%. So um, that's what we want to work with uh, Mac pricing. Any questions about that part? Especially drug price increases. As I mentioned, this has been um, the biggest challenge for us. Um, if you take a look at just the average brand um, price increases over the last um, several years, brand drugs in general have just been going up in prices. Over here, you can see the average increase in brand drugs, this is including specialty drugs, um, for the last decade or so. Right? While well, the red line is um, the inflation rate, CPI. Um, and you see it's been outstripping it year over year over year, right? When manufacturers have, you know, there's no competition for that drug, and it often uh, winds up getting these large price increases. It gets even more so, though, when you start looking into the impact of specialty drugs, that small subset of overall drugs. So remember, these are only 2% of script. So if I go ahead and take a look at what has been going on with our drugs. So this is about how much money, what percentage of our overall cost has been spent on special drugs. And you see we're now up to 55%, right? It's been growing, the red line's been growing consistently while the other part has been uh, dropping significantly over time. So why is that? Are people using a lot more? Well, here's the number of scripts that have been going through our system, right? And so if you look at it, once again, the red is the special drugs. We've gone from 6,500 up to, I'm trying to read my own, about 20,000, right? So that has tripled, right? But still, in terms of a percentage of the overall volume, it's really small, right? So the reason why special drugs has seen that rapid increase isn't just because of the number of scripts. If you take a look at the increase in the cost per script for special drugs versus everything else, this is where you really see the big difference. So back in 2008, it was about $1,300 per month for a specialty drug, and now it's up over $5,500. Meanwhile, for all the non-specialty drugs, we were at around $48 in 2008, and today we're at $63. I'm trying to read my own math here. Um, it's grown somewhat. But if that was the entire extent of pharmacy pricing increases over that time period, forty eight dollars over sixty three dollars, I probably wouldn't be sitting here to talk about pharmacy. Nobody would really care, right? It's this rapid increase that we're seeing on specialty drugs that has been uh, causing problems for inflating overall health our pharmacy costs and then uh, healthcare costs in general. Do you buy into the argument that sometimes the uh, makers of the specialty drugs use that? Um, say, for example, it's an oral oncology drug that it's reducing costs elsewhere in the system because people aren't um, having the adverse reactions to the, the uh, uh, chemo and things like that. They're not getting the nausea, they're not getting this, they're not. Um, do you think there's any offset? Or? So there is an offset. It's not entirely to the amount of the medication, the cost of the medication. Um, so the the point I always make about that is um, the cleanest example to really talk about is with um, hepatitis C, right? Because it's a straight up cure, right? 
people that used to have it, and this new um, class of medication that has come out is a pill form. It has like 95 to 98 percent cure rate, right? It's a fantastic medication. And that's the point I always make about these special drugs. These aren't garbage medication. These are wonderful medications. These are stuff that we want to have as part of our society, right? And they're like, if, you know, someone with rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, if you're bedridden with rheumatoid arthritis, and you start taking Humira, Enbrel, and so forth, and you're up living a normal life, that's fantastic, right? That's what we want to have in our society. It's just a matter of what is affordable and sustainable over the long haul, right? And same thing with hepatitis C. Um, you know, when the drugs came out, Sovaldi and then eventually Harvoni, um, Gilead Sciences was the company who brought the drugs to market, right? They charged it initially as around $85,000, right? So in England, for their healthcare system, they have an institute called NICE, N-I-C-E, that actually does studies to say, to that point, like, what is the cost offset? What should we be paying for this medication? And they came back and they said, you know, for all the costs of all the transplants and all the other things that are associated with hepatitis C, the price should be $55,000. But Gilead Science has said at $85,000. So they're basically making $30,000 profit on all those folks that, or not profit, but $30,000 beyond what the cost was before. And that's what the issue is. Now, if you've been living with hepatitis C, and all of a sudden there's a cure where it's an eight to 12 month uh, course of treatment, and then you're done, I mean, that's fantastic, right? This is what we want. Um, it's just that when Gilead Science has set that price, they set it at such a level that they were able to recover 100% of their entire investment in the R&D in year one, right? Like, so there isn't a cost offset. I do believe that things you know that reduce you know uh, nausea and so forth around chemo. There is that, but the prices are still set at a point where it's either entirely you know the cost of the drugs is entirely offset, whatever savings there's on the medical side, or it's even higher than what it would be, right? And we're just shifting the cost from the medical realm to the pharmaceutical. Cool. So I, I don't doubt that there is an offset, but I. Don't see a decrease in our overall healthcare costs as a result of people taking more medications. All right, um, what medication are we talking about? We're talking about special drugs. As I mentioned, uh, Humira treats um, rheumatoid arthritis. Our number one drug is what Blue Cross Blue Shield spends the most money on. We have 374 patients out of our 140,000 members that we have farm spent for. We spent $17 million for that. Once again, if you're a bedroom and you room to arthritis, this is fantastic stuff. It's just, it's very expensive uh, to go ahead and provide. Um, Harvoni, the price of it has now come down. Um, it's been on the market for a few years, and um, the initial wave of Pepsi patients has come and gone. As I mentioned, Gilead made 100% of their investment back in year one. The price has come down significantly since then. We're now, uh, there's been some other competitors come into the market and be able to get the price down to around 30000 for a course of treatment rather than 85000 um, Enbrel, competitor to Humira. Um, the story with Enbrel and Humira is they've actually lost patent um, protection and they are fighting the introduction of the biosimilar, which is like biosimilar is a generic drug, uh, or a biosimilar is a brand drug, is a generic drug, is to a brand drug. Um, they've been fighting the introduction because they know that will encourage use of the biosimilar, the same way we encourage use of the generic drug um, and cut into the large thing. Capaxone for multiple sclerosis. Um, Tecfidera also for multiple sclerosis. Um, but you can see all of them, I mean, uh, for Kambi, once again, fantastic medicine for um, children with uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, there's a kid I know in Vermont uh, who has cystic fibrosis and he's on Orkambi and he plays on the high school soccer team, varsity soccer team, which is an amazing testament to how wonderful that medication is. Um, that he's able to go around and do a lot of running and everything. Um, it's great, but eight patients, $1.5 million. Once again, it's what is sustainable. Um, and so the pricing is just really challenging to go ahead and manage. Particularly when you start, um, I don't want to get to this point. Um, have a slide in here. All right, but the, the issue is that because there's so few people that take special drugs, they impact employers differently. So one employer can go ahead and have a couple, uh, like three or four 
patients have special drugs, and their cost can get blown out of the water. Meanwhile, somebody else can go ahead and have no bite as a special drug patient, and their costs look very different, right? They're not having those huge cost increases. And that's um, one of the things that makes it really difficult for some clients, and just happen to have the bad luck of having that really high cost increase where others don't. Um, so this is the slide where we look at our inflation rate by drugs, and you see um, these are the ones that have the largest inflation rate. You can see this is the increase in the AWP per unit um, for the different drugs. And you look at Humira and Enbrel, the two ones with the largest uh, increases there. Um, Stellar is another special drug, Revlimid, um, Humira again, so Gelenia. These are the ones that are having these largest increases, and you can see just the impact from the inflation rate from the price increases taken from by the manufacturers. So one of the arguments that they often make is that they pay the rebates, and the reason why they have to take the price increases is because we keep on forcing them to have to pay these rebates. And they're trying to put the cart before the horse on that one. Um, it is true that we do want to claw back as much rebates as possible for our clients, right? That's an important thing that we want to do to try and manage costs. However, the price increases they're taking are outstripping the increases in the rebates that we're getting. So, for example, oops, I'm doing the wrong button here. Um, in 2015 to 2016, the AWP for all of our drugs increased about $18.5 million. Our rebates, at the same time, increased about $1.6 million. So if I look at the uh, AWP per claim, right, that grew by $30. One dollars and twenty-five cents. Meanwhile, the rebate per claim grew by two dollars and eighteen cents. So I fell behind by about twenty-nine dollars per claim <coughs> over the course of that year. So even though the rebates can wind up increasing, you can still wind up having a larger negative impact by the increase in the price that the manufacturers go ahead and take. Same thing, 2017 and 2016 into 2017, twenty-two point eight million dollar increase in AWP, while our rebates only increased. $6.8 million. So we fell behind, going from $35 increase per claim on the list price, while the rebate fell be, um, grew by only $8.38. So when you hear this argument, they say that, oh, well, they have to keep on increasing the price because they have to pay us more rebates. It's a little bit of baloney in that they are taking much larger price increases than what the rebates were. If that was the case, then it wouldn't be much. Um, so biosimilars, as I mentioned earlier, these are um, these are what we're hoping to help control the specialty drug costs. <coughs> one of the things that Vermont took a good step forward last year where they added biosimilars into the um, substitution law that is out there already for generics. There's a law that says you know, we want to go ahead and substitute in a generic for a brand when it's available. They added biosimilars into this. And now we just need the biosimilar market to become more robust than it is right now. Um, the, Biosimilar drugs are already available in Europe. They tend to be about 25 to 30% less than specialty drugs. Um, the first ones came out in March of 2015. We're still waiting on those ones for the really big drugs, though. Um, Humira and Enbrel, uh, they got tied up in the course. They're talking about maybe 2021 by the time that we see the biosimilar for that to enter the market. So in the meantime, we're going to keep on taking large price increases, like I was saying back on this slide where they know that biosimilars come to market and they know what the insurers are gonna do about switching over to the biosimilars, so they're gonna grab as much um, margin now as they can. When that court case uh, gets settled, is there any retroactive payment? No. No? no. But this is one of the things that, um, you know, the number of bills have been floating around in D.C. about trying to go ahead and stop the use of the court system to hold up the introduction of generics and biosimilars. The market and these are a really bright place for where federally good law changes go ahead and help out with everybody. That along with the um, FDA, we really want the FDA, when you look at generic drugs, right, there's a brand name like say, you know, um, uh, Lipitor, right, and then the generic name would be Simvastatin. Um, Simvastatin is the same for every single generic drug and everything, right? Um, what we want is biosimilars to be also the same sort of naming convention, which implies an interchangeability between and not have every biosimilar come out with its own brand name. We want the FDA to go ahead and impose a 
naming convention and also a designation of interchangeability between all of them so that we have a really robust biosimilar market like we do with uh, the generic market. And I think we'll get there eventually. It's just going to take years of pushing back, I guess, and trying to get the right balls passed. Um, this is just pointing out that the, the price differential um, in Europe and so forth, I've mentioned that. All right, generic drug price increase. This has gotten a lot of headlines lately um, in the last few years, and so I just want to address it. Um, generic drug price, some examples have occurred where generic drugs have had huge price increases, but in general, generic drugs have a very little inflation rate. Remember the chart I was showing earlier with like the double digit inflation rate on brain drugs? If you look at, this is Blue Cross Blue Shield's um, generic drug inflation rates. 3.5%, 3.2%, 2.1, 0.2, 0.1. Those are manageable um, amounts. That's the sustainable levels of inflation that we can deal with, right? There have been some really extreme examples, though. Um, doxycycline, oops. Yeah. Doxycycline went from $1.97 per day up to $2.16 per day in 2015. There's some um, manufacturing issues and so forth um, around that. Uh, Daraprim is a story that um, we had with our friend Martin Screlly, uh, who was in the news quite a bit for a while. This is an issue where there are some really old generic drugs that has so little volume on it that there's only one manufacturer out there, right? But there is still some volume on it. And what he and some other um, companies did, they understood that there's so much cost to go ahead and get a manufacturing facility ramped up to get approved to go ahead and produce a drug. You can buy the rights to that one drug and that one manufacturer that was doing that, and then you go ahead and basically set the market for whatever you want it to be. So he took this drug called <coughs> Araprim, which had been on the market for $13.50, and nobody else was making it. Nobody was going to go through the expense for the small market, but he can go ahead and increase the price up to $750, and nobody can do anything about it. Right? And there have been a series of these kind of drugs that are out there. They're often very low line. We've taken the approach of, once again, that counter detailer, that pharmacist we have out there. We identify what patients would be on those drugs, and we work with a compounding pharmacy out in San Diego called Impermis, that they'll go ahead and they'll do a compound of that medication where Daraprim is often taken with potassium, so they'll compound um, the active ingredient Daraprim with uh, potassium, and they'll send it to the person for $1 per pill. Right? And so we'll go ahead and have uh, carry off and visit the doctor and talk to him about $750 versus $1 for the doctor to go quite open to that. So we try and push back on a more nuanced uh, approach to it. But in aggregate, these are abuses that do occur out there. Now, in aggregate, they don't really amount to anywhere, even a small smidgen compared to the impact that those price increases from the special drugs have. So in Vermont, we uh, a few years ago passed what I call the uh, Walk of Shame bill that basically uh, Green Mountain Care Board working with DIVA uh, puts together a list of the highest priced increased drugs yep. for the previous year and the previous five years. And then the Attorney General can, can then um, have conversations with the manufacturer to try to figure out why. And one of the frustrating things is that the list that, that we're getting um, it does not reflect rebate pricing, so it may not be accurate. Is there a better way that we, we could be doing this? I think it's been updated now, because I know I just worked on these analysis for um, Agatha at the Green Mountain Care Board, as well as um, Jill Abrams at the Attorney General's office, and we're now including rebate information in there to eliminate that point. Because the manufacturer will go ahead and you say, well, this is not including the impact of rebates, so we're now looking at it on a post-rebate basis. So we're now getting the net price? I, I agree. What I sent over was that, and I think that's what's out on the website right now. So I think that okay. has been correct. That part has been correct. Dean is in the audience, too. So. Nancy Hoke, who, who does the list, is oh. here. So Great. Yeah. But one so. of the things that um, was popping up, because you, you're saying that generics um, aren't really the problem in the growth, and um, several of the drugs that end up on the list were generics. Yeah, so you have to also look at the amount of volume on those ones. So there yep. are some that have really high price increases. As I mentioned, there are some examples you know, that have gone through where people have found like a drug and such low volume on it and there's only one manufacturer. They can go ahead and it's a bureaucratic monopoly, what I would call it, because the bureaucracy of going ahead and getting your plant up to speed and approved by the FDA to go ahead and produce a drug 
it's not worth it, right? So you can go ahead and take that one drug and jack up the price, but there's so little volume on those drugs that it doesn't really have an impact on the overall aggregate amount that Blue Cross Blue Shield or any other payer is paying, right? But they've been able to find those options. They can make a lot of money for themselves, and it's wrong, and it should be addressed. Um, but it's not the overall driver of our drug costs. The drug, driver of drug costs is really those price increases on special drugs like Humira and Enbrel. And a big reason for those price increases is, and this is why the manufacturer will never go ahead and say this, but the reason is that they know that eventually those biosimilars are gonna hit the market and they're gonna lose their market share to those biosimilars, and so they wanna go ahead and take a larger price increase on those drugs that they are doing. And they're not gonna put that in any sort of a statement to them because it comes off as rather gauche, right? But that's basically what's going on. So. Um, this is the slides I was talking about, impact to, um, so this is a local mental health substance uh, use disorder um, provider. This is the impact from specialty drug costs. If you take a look at, this is the non-specialty plan cost for them. They have a 3.7% decrease in cost, but just a handful of patients for them. Just the unfortunate thing is that, you know, these are again, great drugs, but they have huge price increases. Um, they had two patients on Enbrel, patient on um, Ofev, uh, patient on Harboni, and patient on Fabrizon. They had 73.8% increase. You know, three hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars in additional cost. So now that provider has to charge more for their services in order to offset that. So this winds up rippling through the entire healthcare system when it happens to anybody. Um, or this is a local college in Vermont that um, they had a one point five percent increase on non-special drugs. These are that's what the generic drugs are lumped in. Like I said, you know, this isn't really what the trend problem part is in the specialty drugs. Where you know, for this employer this local college, 244% increase in specialty drugs, right? Just a huge part of that is um, this price increase. That's $283,000 that they have to find in their budget to go ahead and take care of from that increase in the specialty drugs, right? So that's, you know, we really want to impact a couple of our, you know, employers. And you mentioned someone else, we went out to one, they had no specialty drug rate, they're like, yeah, everything. They just got like a 1.5% trend, they're happy. Like, yeah, everything's great. I don't know what the issue is. So, any questions about that? I have one slide on lab pricing I just want to throw out there. If I still have a second. Yep, go ahead. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about these increases in pricing on farms. I just want to give you a heads up that there's a developing issue on a large increase on lab work as well. Um, lab is